So we're going to start now into how to treat each of these components, each of the factors that motivate school refusal. And the first thing we'll look at is for those kids who are refusing because they're escaping negative affect. All right? There is, uh, we're going to go through each of these, but the, the treatment would be comprised of educating, and we'll talk about that, giving these kids some somatic management skills because they're experiencing distressing sensations that go along with being anxious or depressed, um, doing what we call systematic desensitization, which is a gradual step-by-step -step, uh, going into situations that bother them and that challenge them while learning and using their relaxation skills, um, and stepping things up to giving them more and more demand and harder things as we move along. The focus is on helping these kids to develop a sense of being, that they can, they can handle a situation and master it. And if not, they can problem solve effectively. That they have the skills and ability to deal with a situation rather than escape and avoid and withdraw. This is self-efficacy, being able to get in there and manage. So the first thing that we do is we educate the kids and the parents about why they started this school refusal in the first place. What was it and what is it that's in your mind that's, that you are thinking about, you know, that got this going? And to understand, you know, as you have assessed them, if there's anxiety and mood issues, uh, whatever has come up that has put them in function number one, they're escaping from what? Panic, they're escaping from worry, they're escaping from some phobic thing, they're escaping the feelings of depression. You've got to teach them about what that is. Because especially at kids, as kids, all they know is they feel miserable. Mm -hmm. And they feel better when they're not there. A friend of mine yesterday I was with, who will remain nameless because she's an anxiety researcher at another school here in town right now. Uh, she told me about her four-year-old, who's a really bright little guy, but he's, he's anxious. And he says to her, he doesn't want to go to school because he feels funny in his body. Now, you know, for a little guy, it's hard to articulate what he's afraid of. Something, he's feeling funny because he's, he's afraid of something or thinking he's afraid of something. You know, so she's helping and working with him on understanding that the butterflies he may be feeling or the shakiness he may be feeling and stuff, that, you know, he's got to learn to figure out, he's work with him on what, what's happened that makes him feel that way. Is it, you know, something going on that gives him those feelings more than, and more sometimes and not other times? You know, to understand, get the focus of the fear. But the important thing with, you know, older kids from seven up where they can understand, they can understand that their body interacts with the world. And we start from the very beginning. We teach kids that, look, we've got these great bodies. Eh, some are better than others, but anyway, we've got these bodies. <laughs> that have these nervous systems in them. And the nervous system is a really cool thing. Now, I don't want to get into religious ideology, but way back when, in the cave days and before, when we didn't have traffic lights, house alarms, locks on doors, things like that, uh, you know, there wasn't anything to alert the early people to danger. So their nervous systems then developed in such a way that we have a nice little system in our brain that sets off the fight or flight response and alerts us to danger. And so as you can imagine, before there were houses and people were out there, hunters and gatherers, they'd be walking through the woods and they'd be chasing down something maybe, you know, looking for food. And all of a sudden from behind, they hear footsteps, uh, you know, or twigs breaking. They didn't even need to be aware of this because this little part of the brain would recognize it and start sending the body signals in a certain way to get it ready to fight, flee, or freeze. 
And this was really cool that this, the body did this for you because then you all of a sudden get ready and you get ready because certain hormones are released, adrenaline is being one of them, um, and you start doing certain things like quickening your breathing so more oxygen comes in and your blood starts pumping, your heart's pumping more but to get that oxygen to the muscles to prepare you, right, to either take that thing that's out there home for dinner, <laughs> run away from it so you don't get taken home for dinner, or freeze, which is in the wild what some animals do will play dead if in this moment that you've, you know, your cortex cat caught up with this part of the brain that is the signal, figures out, wait, I don't have time to do anything, flop. <laughs> My kid with Asperger's I just talked about, this helped him to understand why does he, you know, what are these panics about? And, you know, what I said is, you're frozen, because he does, he shuts down, he freezes. And I said, look, you know, the thing to do is just sit there for a minute. Fight, flight, or freeze. Let it thaw. He's like, what? I said, in the wild, and he understood how he has a dog. He sees that it freezes sometimes when it's afraid. You know, the thing of it is, you think about how long it would take for a predator to nose around and sniff around what looks like now a dead body. The predator, these other animals, they've learned, I'm not going to eat something that's dead. It could be spoiled or get sick. They nose around for a little bit, and then they, they leave. And I asked this guy, I said, how long do you think it takes for a predator to do that? He said, I don't know, five, ten minutes. How long is a panic attack? It lasts five to ten minutes. So you sit because your body was, was over time, evolution has worked in such a way that your system, after ten minutes, you'll be back to baseline. Fight, fight, or freeze. freeze. We explain this to the kids that this is a system, now somehow, you're not in a cave living in the wild with Tyrannosaurus outside. You're in South Florida. Okay, all right. And you have learned somehow to set off these alarms at times when you don't need them. Really, is your teacher a Tyrannosaurus Rex? Uh, you know, really, is the panicky feeling you're having going to harm you? Nope. Really, all these what if questions, what if I don't get the answer right, what if, is it going to be that bad if you mess up a little? So much that you're so afraid, you're acting as if school and everything about it is so dangerous. So you've learned to trip these alarms and get afraid and the cool thing is you can unlearn. You can actually learn how to cope and get control over that part of your brain. All right? So this is psychoeducation. And with depression, you know, similarly, what we tell the kids is, I want you to think about people you know in your family. Who is the bearer of bad tidings? The aunt who always calls to tell you, oh my gosh, it's raining here where I live, and I had the laundry out. <laughs> OK, uh-huh. <laughs> Who's the bearer of bad tidings in your family? Who's the hothead? always flying off the handle angry about something. Who's the happy person? Nothing bothers, everything rolls off them. Okay. We all have moods. Who's the sad sack down in the dump? You know, we all have moods. Moods are normal. These feelings of anxiety are normal. These feelings of being down at times are normal. The thing of it is most of us function with our moods and our f emotions in a range like this. We get a little less upset, we get a little more upset. You know, we go back and forth through the course of the day depending on what's going on. But these kids have learned to let the moods get this big. They get more depressed. They get more down in the dumps. They get more nervous and scared. So we're going to teach them skills to bring it back to normal. And the important thing is for kids to recognize that when they wake up in the morning, and it's a day like it was this morning with rain, it was kind of dark and cloudy, over, you know, overcast. Any one of us would want to pull the covers back over our head. So it's normal to not wake up, you know, exactly happy every day. You've got to push through it anyway. Let, don't let that normal mood then for, for the day 
take over and become you know, the big thing in your life and happen again and again and again, you've got to push through it, and we're going to teach you how to do that. So this is the beginning of our psychoeducation, understanding where moods come from, these nervous systems, and how they developed over time. Uh, you know, and I will say this. I work with, I get a, um, a lot of referrals uh, where I am in New York from ultra-Orthodox families for their teenagers who have anxiety, uh, mostly girls. And uh, typically, my first sessions like this is with the mom and dad sitting in the room with us to make sure that the Catholic, liberal, intellectual, secular, whatever I am, not orthodox person, is not going down that path of, of evolution in explaining things. And that's OK. So I can start with a family who's ultra-religious in the way that they are with a different take on where this comes from that starts with, you know what? Here we have these bodies, however we got them. Some say through the great maker, through God. And you know, they've got these inborn alarm systems that were useful when we were in the tribe in the desert trying to run away from the Egyptians. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're in New York. And we live in buildings. And I'm not kidding that. So, but we still have these alarms, because that's what was given to us. You can get control. So you've got to, in other words, work with you know, what culturally is put in front of you, religious and stuff like that. You know. So I would love to get my hands on Rick Santorum for a few minutes. But. OK. Uh, then the other important thing to let kids know is when, in psychoeducation and the parents too, is that you can't just say, calm down, brighten up. Any emotion we look at is made up of three components. What you think. So what's the dialogue in your mind? What you feel physically the nervousness, butterflies, shakiness of anxiety, the fatigue of depression, the tension of anger, whatever the emotion is, what you think, what you feel, and what you do. Withdrawal, escape, avoid, beg, cry, fight, you know, the three components. If we understand how you're responding in any given situation, when mom tells you to get up from school, for school, when you're on the school bus, when you're sitting in a class, when you stay home during the day, if we understand how any situation affects what you think and it changes the things you're thinking, what you're feeling, and what you do, that's going to help us then to get in there and deliver and teach you certain ways of changing each component to be in line with thinking in terms of coping and problem solving, calming down the sensations that are disruptive, and keeping on a path of going forward instead of retreating. Think, feel, do. But it's different than saying, just relax. Now it's saying, let's see, what are you saying to yourself when the teacher calls on you? And what's happening in your body? The kids can respond to that, and we can apply and teach them certain things to do around those things. So the psychoeducation teaches them about emotions, teaches them about how to break it into three parts so they can learn how to manage them. And then the next thing is we start asking them to keep a diary of situations and then what I think, what I feel, what I did in each. I ask them because, look, they're not used to doing homework if they're out of school. They don't want to do homework. They don't want you in their house. They don't want you to come to your office, get out of my face, just leave me alone. But you're there. And we have to start working together to uncover this, because the goal is going back to school. I, I don't fool any kid. You're here because of school refusal. You're here because you have trouble going, trouble staying. You're here because you've been out for X number of months or years. Our goal is to get you back in. We're going to work together on this. We're going to try to pace it to you. But I need you to help me here. So I'm going to ask you, because you're the only person who can be the detective to uncover what's in the three components. 
or the scientist, whatever, you know, is their thing. You're the only person who, when your mom comes in the room in the morning and says, do you want to go to school today, you are the only one who knows what pops into the thought bubbles outside of your head now. And you're the only one who can tell us what happens in your body. She can tell us some of what you do. She'll observe you saying, ah, oh, moaning, throwing the covers over your head, throwing a, a shoe at her or whatever. But I really want to know from your perspective, too, what are you doing? So you've got to start keeping a diary. And I want at least three different situations each day on the diary form. And it's a simple piece of paper you could use of mom, you know, something about mom and getting ready to go to school, something about when you're home and you haven't gone. If you've gone, something about school. And then give me something what, that you've dealt with OK. Because we want to know, when you're coping well, what are you thinking, what are you feeling, what are you doing? Was there a comment? I guess that initially, you, do you find that you must get buy-in from the student? Like, just like you get buy-in from the parent as far as how this is not going to work for him or her long term, getting buy-in from the child just so that they, so that the answer is, yes, I want to go back to school. And that's a goal that I'm willing to work with. Yes. And that, that is through this psychoeducation. Um, what I also might be working with, you see, this is where I'm really like the therapist here in that I'll get down to, what's it, what's going on when you're here and you're, you know, your friends are all at school together? Um, you know, I had, a, you know, I, the, the place where I made the most movement at one time with one of these kids uh, who I talked about earlier, the one who was out for and hasn't ever gone back, is he really would shut down, wouldn't speak in session. And I said to him, because now it was senior year, I said, uh, fall of senior year, I said, uh, wow, um, I imagine your friends are applying to colleges now. How do you feel about that? And he broke into tears and started crying. It sucks. What have I done to myself? OK. You know, so you've got to take where they are and try to think about what would a third grader, or fifth grader, or seventh grader who's not in school, where is, what can we work with here that they may you know, be missing out on? It's motivating them. You know, you've got to, there are, you could use motivational interviewing if you know that approach. Uh, you're engaging them around, we're going to work together, tell us why or what would be good about you going back to school. What would you have that you don't have now? Different things that you can do there to engage. Find the nugget, the hook, right? The nugget comes from Don Meikenbaum, if you've ever seen him. He works at the Melissa Centers. Institute. The Melissa Institute. He, he is my, one of my gurus. He's been around for a long time, and he's a phenomenal behavior therapist. And he always says, go after that nugget. So we got psychoeducation down. And just so you know, the psychoeducation you're going to do for everyone. So psychoeducation is the first, you know, after assessment, that's like one of the first things you do for any child who comes in for cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and this will be the same psychoed pretty much across the four uh, functions of school refusal. Um, the big thing for kids and their parents to understand, too, and this is part of psychoed, is that when it comes especially to anxiety, you know, avoidance and escape are the two big ways anxiety is maintained. And when it comes to kids who have depression, withdrawal, isolation is another way that depression is maintained. Because what happens is, in, in both cases, they stop interacting with the environment. They no longer get reinforced by the environment. They lose friendships. They lose things. They stop doing things they normally would be doing. And that you know, feeds anxiety. It feeds the feeling that life isn't worth living for the kids who are depressed or you know, there's nothing out there for me. So a big thing is understanding that avoidance um, is and, and withdrawal, these, these nab you in that component, the, one, the three components in the behavioral part. When you give in and give up, this is really helping to set in place anxiety and depression. It's got you trapped. Interference in functioning is something also 
we have to understand and teach the kids and their parents that they're not keeping pace with where they need to be developmentally. And while some of the things that kids have to do developmentally, like go to school, complete you know, homework, ride the school bus, different things like that, while they feel burdensome, we've got to help them see the brighter side of these things. Riding the bus gets you to school for what? There's not just learning, which is really exciting, but also, again, for making the friends, for meeting new people, you know, that there's benefits to sticking with it. But the interference in functioning is a big deal that will, again, uh, set the child back and keep them stuck in, in the anxiety or depression that they manifest. The distress that they experience is something else we look at in helping them to see that and understand that these, by monitoring and keeping track of what triggers your upset and the way that you think about it, feel, and the way things that you do, we need to get a handle to make their distress proportional to what actually is in front of them. Because over time, they have learned that the littlest signal to anxiety means major blow up, major, major catastrophe. In fact, catastrophizing for someone who's anxious or depressed is a big thing. You know, they blow it out of proportion. Well, we want to bring it into, we want to bring it back down and help them be upset at the level they should be upset because then they can start managing the, their problem. And then, you know, the other thing in terms of just deciding whether something's disorder or not is the duration that anything sticks with it. And we've, when we see with the school refusers, we have to talk about the longer you've been out, the worse it gets. So we want to try to get you at least back in and moving along, meeting with the teacher, talking to them, maybe, maybe you Skype with the teacher after school. It's anything in every way to start changing that trend and ending the long duration that's been going on of not functioning within the school. Um, the things that we ask kids then to start moving along with in this treatment is identifying their anxiety. So are you expecting bad things to happen? What are those things? Try to elucidate that. Are you worrying about upsetting others? In what ways? You know, do you think this will be upsetting to others? Uh, are you constantly seeking reassurance? And these are things that you have to ask the parents about with their kids. Are you perfectionistic? I've got a lot of kids who s refuse school because they don't want to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the concept and understanding that mistakes get us feedback that help us to progress is hard for kids to understand, but we've got to work with that. Are they worried about failure, um, get very physically jittery, wiggly and that? Do they lack self-confidence? These are things you should be seeing start to appear. These are the things you want to see on their monitoring forms. It tells you that they're accurately reporting on their experience. If their monitoring forms just say, I was scared, I didn't feel good, I left, and it doesn't really give you good information. You've got to work with them and question them about what, okay, so what did, were you thinking? What was the image in your mind? Uh, I didn't feel good. Okay, so you didn't feel good. What, is, what would happen from not feeling good? What would be the next thing that happens when you don't feel good? You've got to question them to move them along, all right? Um, so just identifying anxiety and helping them to see what, it is that nabs them each day, right? Now, the thing you're gonna do in the first function of treatment is work from what's called systematic desensitization. This is one of the mainstays of cognitive behavioral therapy for working with anxiety. Developed in the 1950s, actually, by a physician researcher, Dr. Joseph Wolpe, who was working in a lab uh, in, in the area of physiology, and what he noticed, he, in the lab they had animals, mainly cats, who they were using for different kinds of experiments in terms of physiological mechanisms, and what he noticed is that 
these cats, you know, they were afraid of the people who were working in this laboratory who came in with their white lab coats. Because they were going to get poked and prodded and everything else, these poor things. Except the cats, and you know, you know when a cat's afraid, you know, it rises up. But he noticed that, wow, the cats actually did okay during the times when those same white lab coats walked in with the plates of food to feed them. And he started thinking about this. Wow, they're afraid except when there's a competing <laughs> response of hunger that overrides the fear. Well, to make a long story short, he started working with humans who were afraid, phobic, agoraphobics, people were afraid of specific objects and things and situations. And he started this approach of making a hierarchy of what it was you were afraid of, but then the first step for him was to teach the patient to relax through a tensing and relaxing muscle procedure. Have any of you used this kind of muscle, progressive muscle relaxation? And of course, built into it was deep diaphragmatic breathing, deep slow breathing. Anyone who's done any yoga, any meditation, I mean, this is the mainstay nowadays. Everybody's used the breath, you know. <laughs> All right, whatever. In other words, slow your breathing down, make it deep. And actually, there's a physical reason for that. When you breathe shallowly into your chest only and don't use the whole, um, your, all of your lung capacity and the diaphragm isn't engaged, you are actually subtly hyperventilating. And by subtly hyperventilating, you're getting more oxygen than you need. And there's an imbalance between the oxygen and carbon dioxide then in your system that is supposed to be in some sort of simpatico balance. So you get, it's easier for you to trigger anxiety symptoms because you're always on the verge of being able to be lightheaded, tingly, feel breathless. So doing deep breathing resets that calms and, and keeps you smooth and calm. So Wolpe taught people how to, who were, who were phobic, how to relax. And then what he did was he would present to them a scene of what they were afraid of with the instruction that I'm going to, you know, talk about the thing you're frightened of. When you start to feel anxious, raise your hand or give me a signal and we'll go back to doing the relaxation. Now, let me tell you the story of a young boy I worked with many years ago who was phobic of airplanes and flying. And what this was came from is he he was on a flight on a foreign carrier um, at one point, and in mid-flight, the plane was st struck by lightning, which they didn't know, but in mid-flight, all of a sudden, the plane just suddenly dropped. So, you know, the oxygen masks came out, things flew out of the overhead bins, people were screaming. This kid was about nine years old at the time, freak out, and for whatever reason, when they recovered, the plane recovered, and there were people crying the way the mother told it and everything, the crew never explained what happened. So they had about three more hours in this flight, I think it was from Paris to Egypt, with everybody white knuckling it. <laughs> okay, they got there. Apparently, they had to medicate this kid out of his mind to get him to fly home. And he refused to fly after that. And his parents were international business people. It didn't make for, you know, it was difficult for them. So when I got him, you know, his thing was, ain't getting on a plane. They had, you know, for three years, they had endured him not going anywhere, always having somebody always be home, family couldn't have a vacation at the house in France, blah, blah, blah. So I say to this kid as I set up a systematic desensitization because you, I can't put kids on planes to just do it, what's called exposure. I got to set them up for it and then we get to the point. So I say to him, and this is, you'll get a sense of some of my caseload, tell me about, as I, I start for the relaxation, I want to know about the most relaxing, easygoing place where you feel most wonderful when you're there. Where would that be? 
and he looks at me, he says, oh, in my bedroom on the island of Mykonos. Because I'm going to, I'm like, OK. Thank goodness I lived in Pompano Beach to know what an island, not island, but know what the water and beach looks like. Anyway, I had this kid describe for me what it looks like there. You know, give me the colors. Do you hear the ocean? What's the, you know, the, the smell? Is there fruit trees? Whatever. You know, and I construct this whole scene with him of being comfortable and relaxed there. And we go through progressive muscle relaxation training. And then, OK, he, he's in his state. And then I'm like, OK, James, you walk into the living room, and your mom is on the phone. And she's talking with the travel agent and making plans to take the whole family on a trip overseas flying to your house in France. And she's making plans that you're going to be flying. And once you get there, and of course, he starts raising his hand right away. You know, and then I say, OK, stop thinking about that. You are in your bed, looking out the window. There's a boat going by, a sailboat out on the ocean. You could hear the birds chirping. OK, get him to relax a bit. Then we go back. Your mother is on the phone making these plans. She gives her credit card number, so the tickets are booked. And so it goes. Uh, you go back and forth. You are in the car on the way to the airport. You start seeing signs, LaGuardia, two exits away. You know, and every time he would raise his hand, we'd switch back to that scene, being in his lovely bed in Mykonos, a place I will probably never visit in my life. <laughs> But thank goodness now for Google, you could see pictures of these places. <laughs> so this is the thing. You want to increasingly, you, you can start out imaginally with kids who are intractably not wanting to go to school, going back and forth between relaxation and what it takes, what their, where their school day would look like with getting ready and getting on the bus or someone taking them, and so on and so forth. Now, here's the caveat. Most of us who are in this world and do CBT don't do this imaginally anymore. As often as possible, I get the kids doing something school related in my office to, to put the anxiety in front of them. So they might be there. We might do some relaxation deep breathing, and then I take out a picture of their teacher that I've gotten and a worksheet from what they missed that day. And here, your teacher sent this in. You're going to start working on this. you know. And they're like, uh, OK, let's sit with this anxiety. And let's just look at the picture of your teacher. Let's look at the worksheet. You know, Let's sit with this until the anxiety passes. And I might ask, you know, what's the worst thing that's happening right now? Because the worst thing is always you feel anxious. That's the worst thing. You're feeling anxious. You know, something to bear in mind is that the minute a child starts, and adults do this too, the minute they start to feel the uh-oh, that's their signal to stop. I can't handle this. But wait a minute. We're just at the uh-oh. We're at, uh oh, you know, we got we got more room to move here before you need you feel you need to leave. You know, you should give it a little more. Have a group the other night that I was uh, with. It's my young adults with social phobia, and this one guy who's been in the group now, you know, for a while has been finally, you know, interacting with a young woman. They're in their late twenties, and he said, I, I don't know that I could really, you know, see her again because. You know, I, I don't know if I could call her because, you know, it's like my stomach goes flip-flop and, you know, I get like kind of all shaky. Ugh, I'm a middle-aged woman married for a while. I'm like, oh, buddy, <laughs> those are the feelings you want. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> like, what are you kidding? That's what you're supposed to feel. That's the signal to dive in. Call the woman. Call her up. But this is the thing. They don't understand normal arousal. To them, because they've been anxious for so long, what is 
expected and typical. And yeah, you know, in the morning, you know, you might feel a little bit in your stomach. You know there's a test or whatever's happening. What they feel they take as a signal to bug out, and they don't give that, that arousal time to just run its course. The five to ten minutes that any anxiety is going to burn itself out. So with systematic desensitization, I oftentimes am using the re as much real prop, uh, props that I can of their real worksheets, their books their parents have brought in. Uh, you know, we might call the teacher from my office and have him talk to her so he's having a conversation with her. And I'm like, breathe, just sit with it, let's ride the wave, you know, to, to get them to hang in there and let the anxiety just drop so they could see they can handle it. Yes? In the five to 10 minutes, is that the parameter? Is that like, does it mean? But the question is, in five or 10 minutes, is that the parameters? Typically, yes. It typically is. When we do these kinds of exposures and systematic, and see, just systematic desensitization involves a bit of relaxation paired with an exposure to what they're afraid of going back to some relaxation and exposing them again to what they're afraid of, and you're going back and forth. Well, I tend, you know, to, to keep the exposure steadily moving along in that each step of an exposure, let's say our goal for today is we're going to call the teacher, we're going to have a conversation with her. The exposure will involve thinking about calling her, dialing the phone number, asking for her, ask, and we might write out questions. How are you, Mrs. Smith? How are my, uh, you know, what are you teaching in class this week? Um, can you send me the homework sheets? How is your pet, you know, how's the class pet doing? The exposure is each of those steps moving through to thank you for talking to me, I'll call you again. And so each step on that might be, you know, five minutes to calm down and ask the next question. Of course, I've you know, when I do these contact the teacher exposures like that and stuff, you know, they're ready for it. Obviously, she's got to answer the phone. We do it at a time when she can. But they're also ready for it that he may hesitate, take breaks, just hang out, you know, and uh, let him do the talking. Or sometimes when I first get started, I have her just ask simple yes or no questions just to get him saying yes, no, you know, and that might be the first call and so. So you're going back and forth in a way, but you're working them through that fear and avoidance hierarchy, okay? And that is the, the goal with kids is we never go backwards. We achieve a step on the hierarchy. Here's the thing. We've called Mrs. Smith. We've talked to her today. Now the homework is going to be three more times between now and the time I see you, which is once a week. You're going to call her, maybe, we'll make a, we've made an appointment with her, you'll call her tomorrow, and your mom can sit there and coach you. You're going to call her two more times, you know, the next two days, but you're going to do those on your own. Your mother's going to make sure you call. She says hello, but mom's going to step out. And you've got a cue card that you can use, but you're going to talk with Mrs. Smith on the phone. Three times we practice whatever exposure we've done, we have them practice in between our sessions, minimum of three times to keep them moving along. I do try with kids who are out of school to have two sessions a week. And, uh, you know, and again, this is according to what they're approved in terms of insurance or this and that. I mean, because even though we're, we are fee for service in the way we are, parents want to submit to insurance for reimbursement, so we have to follow as much of a plan for the insurance company as possible. You know, and what's feasible for the family, logistics of getting to us. There's all kinds of things, of course, that, you know, you know, will interact with how often you do this. If the children are out of school or really spotty school refuses, they're missing a couple of days a week, those days off are the days they come in. And we, you know, and it's okay that you drag your kid in to my office in their pajamas, spewing snot and spit and everything else because they're angry. It is perfectly fine. We have washable furniture. And, it, and no one's going to make fun of you for being in fuzzy slippers and pajamas in my place because, you know, that's okay. Uh, but it's going to show you that, you know, we really mean business and we want to get you in here when you can so that we can work at it. All right? So this is what you're going to do with systematic desensitization. These exposures, you start 
with easier things and gradually where, you know, so nowadays they can email the teacher. Uh, you know, there's all different things that you could do with exposures that get them moving along uh, to more challenging and go, go from the imaginal to the in vivo. I'll only do imaginal once or twice. I want them interacting with school stuff. You come to me, my friend Reitman, he's in the back there. You go to him if you have a phobia of animals, insects, snakes, things like that. No more rubber snakes. I work with Duke the Snake Man of Staten Island, New York, who has Mo, Larry, and Ethel, pythons, and bows. We use the real thing because it's, it's so important to teach the, the patient that they can handle the real stimulus, you know? And the imaginal stuff, again, if it's someone who's very, 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 very out there phobic and says, I won't come to your office if you expose me to this, okay, we'll start imaginal. But we're getting as fast as we can to the real thing. Um, the thing about these exposures and putting them on a stepped, graded way up is these kids have not been functioning. You're giving them a supported experience that's step by step in doing what they're afraid of so they're learning that they can. Yes, we can. We can. It's learning you can handle it you know, as you move along. So when we had one woman that I worked with holding a snake finally in her hands and all excited, you know, that, oh, I'm getting over this fear. And the snake decided to relieve itself all over her of his <laughs> dinner from several days before. Hey, things happen. We deal with it. When we bring like animals in and the dog barks or the cat scratches, it happens. You deal with it, you know. Uh, I take kids on subways a lot in New York City because that's how they get to school a lot of them, and the subway's crowded, and there's a scary looking person, you know, to the child, homeless or, you know, uh, uh, real um, teenagers who are yelling at one another, different things on the subways. You see everything on the subways <laughs> in New York, I will tell you. Halloween one year, going home at night from work, and a guy gets on a stop after I got on, dressed as the Texas chainsaw murderer with a real chainsaw. And not only is he on like that, but of course it's all young people because it's all heading down to Greenwich Village. It goes through Greenwich Village to get home to Brooklyn. And they start egging him on, egging him on. And what does he do? Turns on the chainsaw. I'm like, oh my God, get me off. The I should have had a phobia of subways after that. But you see everything on the subways. And it's important for us to to, you know, to expose the kids at the same time when it comes to things like spiders, snakes, insects, dogs, subways, and people that you're having to expose the kids to, you've got to get them ready that things could happen, but you can cope and have a plan to deal. So I got off the subway at the next stop. I did not <laughs> wait to get off with him because, you know, hey. But, you know, so you teach them how to cope with what's going on. Because if you only prepare them for the good things, school is fun. You're going to learn a lot. Oh, you're going to get great grades. The teacher's going to love you. They're, you're going to lose them because reality bites. So they have to, you know, in the course of exposures here, they've got to get grade uh, papers handed back that are marked up red completely. Uh, the teacher, you know, has to be, you know, honest and say, you know, I really need you back in school, you know, at some point. We can't just placate and baby them. We've got to help them face reality and see that they can manage reality as they move along. The other thing is we're decreasing the use of safety signals. This is why when you go home and you do your three practices, the first one you can have help with from your parents, but the next two, you've got to do the bulk of it by yourself because we don't want safety you know, always having safety behavior. Eventually, these kids are going to school without the cell phones. No cell phones for texting. I'm breathing, you know, I feel panicky. Mom, are you there in case I need you? Uh-uh. You know, eventually, 
we are stepping back from being able to leave the classroom, you know, at every hour. You could take a break to say, you know, to see Mrs. Jones, the school nurse, and she's going to help you do your deep breathing, and then you're going to go back to class. Well, we are fading those out through the, the program. You're taking away the safety signals. All right, and whatever other mechanisms they put in place to try ensure, to ensure that they're going to feel great, we got to take them out because you're not. It's okay, but you still can handle it. All right, for the depressed kids, the thing that we have to build in, their exposures are exposing them to pleasant activities and social activities and what we call success activities that they have stopped doing. You work on homework that, and complete it, that's a success activity, okay? Or you take, uh, you read a, a book, you study for a test, take the test, that's a success activity. You call up a friend who you haven't seen because you haven't been in school to say hi and see how things are going or text them or Facebook them that's a social activity. If the kid has stopped doing these things, I tell parents of depressed kids, and also the ones with social phobia we'll talk about, let them on Facebook, or let them do the things the kids today do to social network. If you've got hardcore, she's not having a cell phone until she's 27, well, she's not gonna have a life either. Or she, I don't want her to text, get a plan so she can text. That's how they communicate. And for kids who are depressed, who pull away from their social world, they lose the reinforcement of being in it. We have to help them get in it. We'll put rules down on when and where. I mean, there's rules. Absolutely, I want that cell phone, Facebook, FaceTime, all these different things to be put away at a certain point each day. And of course, you know, once you're in school, you're not using them during school, da, da, da. But we got to get them connected to the things they used to do as depressed kids, but they've stopped doing. This is the reinforcement-based approach to treating depression that Peter Lewinson, a famous psycho behavioral psychologist, came up with many years ago. The more you withdraw, the less reinforcement you get from the environment to help keep you in and keep your mood up. And what happens is these depressed kids, I guess I used to like that, but I don't, you know, I'm just not interested in They used to play on the baseball team or be on the basketball team. They'd go to different clubs, but they don't do this stuff anymore. They did, and these are the warning signs parents say, you know, I don't understand how this happened. You know, all of a sudden, he was just home all the time, not doing anything. So if parents saw systematically things dropping out, we gotta put them back in. So there's social activity, there's uh, success activity, there's self-soothing, relaxing activity. You know, let your daughter go get her nails done, you know, taking a hot bath, listening to music that they like, you know, different things are soothing activities for them. You know, we have to get that stuff back in. So there's a whole, you know, whole approach to helping your kids re-engage. And this is where another caution to the parents. Kids who are depressed, in a way, tend to be easy. They're just holed up in their room. They're not imposing on you, can I use the car? Or can I have money to go to the movies? Or, they're not imposing on the parents. The parents are not having to manage them. No, we want you to manage. We, we want them to be at you for stuff because that's healthy. That's the way kids should be. All right? So we have to activate the kids who are depressed. We have to expose to things the kids who are anxious and, you know, help them using labeled praise and, you know, and positive attention to shape them to more and more of this activity. Instead of just nagging, 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 why aren't you go? You got to try. Let's stop that, parents, and let's get into more. Hey, how, how was it today when you talked to a uh, buddy? You know, what's going on? Is, is there a game this weekend? You know, focusing them on what the, what's out there for them to take advantage of. The goals of these exposures provide experience in these situations, and you're going to teach them, you know, how to problem solve within the situation. So if this thing happens, what can I do to manage it and deal with it? So you go to the teacher, you know, you're worried, 
about how you're going to get all the homework done because you know you've got to maintain the grades that you have because you're setting your sights on getting into that magnet high school and you know boy oh boy and you know I'm worried about all this stuff and how am I going to manage this you know they've got to hear from the teacher you know what you can't do it all maybe it's all right to let something slide you know you're doing okay as it is in social studies don't study as hard there They've got to hear real information and maybe get a less than optimal grade here or there. What's the plan to how to deal with that? All right, manage your time a little differently, set limits on yourself. And a big thing for perfectionistic worriers is to build in relaxation and good sleep hygiene. All right, because they'll, they'll be better at things in that way anyway. All right, those are the goals of exposures. Um, no, that's just a repeat slide, just uh, you know, making sure that you decrease the safety signals. Okay. Any questions on that? You are going to then, in, in function number one, you're going to go through exposure hierarchies, doing systematic desensitization with teaching them how to relax, but at the same time how to gradually, step by step, keep approaching the things you're frightened of or worried about or depressed about. And the more realistic stuff you could do, the better. Comment? Yes? I was just going to ask you if you ever use peers to help with the children. The question is do we use peers to help with the children? Yes, depending on a number of things. These are things that, first of all, the younger the child, so little kids, even preschool, kindergarten, early, first, second graders. Getting the teacher on board to find a naturally good kid who's friendly, not the popular kid, okay? Because they're a little overwhelming. Uh, they've got too many people around them all the time. But just like another solid good kid, to pair your kid that you're working with up with them to run errands together, let's say. Can you take this together to the principal's office? I remember how proud and happy I used to be when I was assigned to go get the milk from the cafeteria for the recess. I don't even know if they do that anymore. But you know, little tasks together and cooperative stuff with a naturally OK peer will go a very long way for a lot of the kids who are afraid of being in school for different reasons riding the bus to get, find a buddy on the bus for the child who's afraid to go ride the bus who's young, um, the kids who you know, don't know how to get out on the playground and stop one activity to go to another, have a peer, come on, let's go, it's time. You know, so matching them up with peers is, is a great thing to do. As they get older, there's a lot more group project type work that's done, middle school. This again, what you might just caution the teacher is, you know, putting the kid into a group with kids who are a little more matched to them and not going to overwhelm them. You put really smart kids together with a kid who has, uh, you know, really, really competitive smart kids with a child with GAD, you're going to be lighting up that worry that I can't compete and I got to get it better and that, that, that. So you want to put them in evenly matched, you know. You got, so you, you've got to watch in different ways that you could do that with making sure you're not lighting up a stigma and, again, stereotyping and, bull, you know, a situation where the kid is look like, uh, look, we got Jonah again we've got to have in our group because he can't do it on his own. You, you got to be careful of these things. Um, but you do, you know, it's, it's a little bit more for the younger kids and then watching the way groups are and lab partners and stuff are matched up for the older kids that you'd want to work with. But when it comes to the teenagers along these lines, they've got to start taking that upon themselves to find peers, you know, and, and do things together with their peers.